Today, we're going to be introducing a bit about the history of the field of genetics and how to look at inheritance. You may see some family resemblance in your own family, much like these celebrities clearly pass down some of their physical traits to their kids. But genetics isn't only responsible for good looks, genetics is also responsible for traits we can't see, or sometimes even predispositions to disease. People have long wondered how this works, and some realities of inheritance were understood long before our modern understanding. For example, the practice of breeding animals to get offspring that have traits you want, like cattle with the best and most meat, or wolves that had the least aggression and the most protective tendencies to help us eventually get modern dogs. These kinds of breeding techniques have been around for centuries, and it wasn't just limited to animals. People also bred plants to give us more nutritious varietals. This process of selective breeding that led to better offspring is called artificial selection, and it's still practiced today. This is how we get the drought-resistant crops or the sweetest peaches. So even though we understood some things about inheritance to help us get the modern dog and corn, there were some historical theories of inheritance that just weren't correct. For example, people believed in the homunculus, which was essentially a tiny baby-like form that was present inside sperm, such that the man was really contributing the baby to the woman, and the baby just grew up inside the woman's womb. That, of course, is not accurate. Another theory that people had was this blending theory of inheritance, where different traits blended together from the two parents. So blue eyes and brown eyes might give you a hazel-eyed offspring, but that's not exactly how that works either. The traits aren't blended, uh, and we'll get to that as we continue to talk about genetics. So those theories weren't the right theories, and in the state of the early 1800s, people still had questions about what actually is inherited, how it's inherited, and what the role of chance was in heredity. Why sometimes you breed two very soft, lambs and then you get really coarse wool in the next generation. So along came Gregor Mendel, an Austrian friar and scientist whose documentation of inheritance forever changed our understanding. Mendel is responsible for what we call the particulate theory of inheritance, which meant that parents pass on discrete heritable units. Of course, he didn't know what those units looked like or what they were, but he knew that parents passed on these discrete inheritable units, and that those units retained their separate identities in the offspring. Today, we call these units genes, which you might be more familiar with, but that wasn't a term in Mendel's vocabulary at the time. So how did he do these studies? He actually used the scientific method while breeding garden peas in carefully planned experiments. So imagine Mendel, he's at this monastery, and in the garden, he's doing these breeding experiments with peas. It sounds like kind of an interesting life he had. So Mendel didn't just luck upon discovering what we now know about genetics. He had these carefully planned experiments. And the keys to those experiments being successful included that Mendel looked at characteristics that had these discrete alternative forms. For example, he looked at plants that only had white or purple flowers. There was nothing in between. There was no lavender or purple with white spots. It was just white or purple. So that's an example of a discrete alternative form. He also looked at plants that pea plants that produced round peas or wrinkled peas. The next key to Mendel's success was that he established pure, true breeding lines. And that means that these plants, over several rounds of self-fertilization, produced only the same trait as the parent plant. White flowering plants that only gave rise to other white flowering plants. Yellow pea plants that only gave rise to yellow pea plants. The last key to Mendel's success was that he was meticulous in keeping records and used quantitative analysis to determine the fundamentals of heredity. And by that I mean he used math. You know, he really kept very detailed records and counted hundreds upon thousands of plants and peas to understand what was happening. So here's a little bit about Mendel's technique. He essentially used the properties of how plants with flowers reproduce to be able to construct his experiments. So his plants had stamens and carpels. And the stamens are these sperm-producing organs, whereas the big kind of green bowling pin-looking structure in the center, that's the egg-producing organ called the carpel, and that's where the ovules are. So Mendel would start by cutting off 
the stamen with scissors. He would take a flower and he would remove these sperm producing organs. That way the flower couldn't self fertilize. It couldn't drop its own sperm onto the eggs and fertilize itself. So now you can see in this picture on the left, the purple flower has no more stamen, right? Those have been removed. So then he would perform cross pollination, fertilization between different plants. And he would essentially take a paintbrush, collect some pollen from a different flower, here the white flower on the right, and he would take that paintbrush covered in pollen and dust it over the carpal of the flower that he had removed the stamen from. So he's essentially taking sperm from one plant and delivering it to the egg of another plant. And this again was called cross-pollination. So now we've had sperm from the white flowering plant delivered to the eggs of the purple flowering plant. And again, he would use true breeding plants to do this experiment. The true breeding plants he started with were called the parental generation. That's the P generation. The fertilized carpal then matures into a pea pod, and those peas were planted to produce offspring plants. The offspring plants are called hybrid plants. They're also called the first filial generation. When he would let that first filial generation self-pollinate, that led to what we call the second filial generation, or the F2 generation. We call this cross a monohybrid cross, a mating between true breeding individuals that are different in one trait. So in this case, they were different only in the flower color, white flowers versus purple flowers. So think about what you notice in this monohybrid cross to the right. We had parental flowers that were purple and white. We then got purple flowers in that F1 generation. We allowed those to self-pollinate planted pea pods from them and grew up our F2 generation. Here are some of Mendel's other observations that are looking at different matings he did, other kinds of monohybrid crosses he did. He mated plants that had round peas to plants that had wrinkled peas. He mated tall plants to plants that were short. He mated plants that had yellow peas to ones that had green peas. So I want you to look at these different crosses there are three here, but he did hundreds of these kinds of crosses. And see what these monohybrid crosses told us. Do you see any similarities between these three crosses? I hope so. Look for that pattern. We're going to talk about it in class, and I'm going to ask you about it in our review section, which comes up next. Okay, so today we learned a lot about the history of what people thought about genetics and what Mendel contributed to our understanding, at least a little bit. So let's review. The creation of certain dog breeds with several rounds of selective breeding is an example of... I hope you're able to get it. The answer is artificial selection. The first cross in all Gregor Mendel's experiments were true breeding, were called the parental generation, were crosses of plants that differed by one discrete alternative form, or all of the above are true. If you don't know, you should pause because I'm about to give you the answer. The answer is D, all of the above are true. Finally, what did Gregor Mendel most commonly see in the F2 generation of his crosses? Blending inheritance. All offspring were like only one of the parental generation. Offspring like both of the parental plants were present. Or did he notice that most of the F2 plants were looking unlike the F1 generation? There's a little example to the left to help you. So pause it here if you need more time to think about it. The answer is C, offspring like both of the parental plants were present. You can see in that F2 generation at the very bottom, you see both round and wrinkled peas. Okay, so hopefully you learned something about the history of genetics. I want you to think a little bit about some critical thinking questions that we're going to discuss in class. Why do you think pea plants made a good model organism in which Mendel could study genetics? And also, would humans make a good model organism to study genetics? Think of reasons why and why not. It's an interesting question. We'll talk about it in class. Thanks, everyone. See you the next time.